Hello, are you ready to laugh? Uh, <laughs> uh, it's a perfect venue to talk about comedy, of course, this very intimate space. Um, and uh, joining me to do that today, as we th think you just heard, but I'm going to reintroduce them because it's all very echoey in here, uh, we have Mike McAvoy, who is the CEO, president of The Onion, which we all know, but actually uh, there are numerous other brands within The Onion, right? So there's Starwipe, Clickhole, The AV Club, and The Onion News Network. A lot of people will have seen some of those. Yeah. Do you have a personal favorite at the moment? I think I uh, love them all uh, and, I'm, you know, and have to, but the personal favorite is Clickhole. I think what The Onion's been able to do in terms of uh, you know, really uh, taking on all things in the internet uh, with Clickhole has been fantastic. So it's a parody of everything viral and vapid. Right, so it's kind of like uh, BuzzFeed through the filter of The Onion. Yeah, BuzzFeed, Upworthy, and really everything silly, uh, you know, and ridiculous in the world. Okay, and also with us, David Schneider, uh, comic writer-director who I watched in the 90s on Friday Night Armistice. Thank you for that. Will always be Tony Lamesma to me, uh, but is now uh, the founder and creative director of social content company That Lot, uh, which basically writes tweets for hire, essentially, but funny tweets. Yeah, I mean, not just funny tweets and, and not just tweets. You know, we, we provide, I mean, our, our background is comedy, but yeah, we do all sorts of tweets, Facebook posts, make videos, make viral content for brands. And, you know, relevant to this, we do the Have I Got News For You Twitter feed. Uh, we do satire for Huffington Post, stuff like that. So white label comedy, basically. Uh, okay, so we're going to talk about satire in the modern age. Um, but I think what a lot of people in here would just like to know is how The Onion works. So let's get that out of the way because it is fascinating and it's been going such a long time. So Mike, talk us through the process. How does a joke start yeah. in yeah. The Onion writer's room? Yeah, so each of the staff writers um, all come up with a bunch of headlines or jokes. Um, and as part of the writing process, you know, every week there's probably 1,500 headlines uh, that the writers select from. And so Writers, you know, read the joke aloud in a room. If, uh, you know, a joke or headline gets a couple votes, it moves on to the next round. Eventually, those 1,500 headlines are whittled down into about 25 a week that we write about. And then from there, it's a really intense writing process where there's, you know, a couple rounds of drafts and a couple rounds of editing, you know, some photoshops that are added to the article, all to ensure that, you know, there's the right comedic take, there's the right target, because um, everything we do is satire, um, and that the comedy traditions of The Onion um, you know, are upheld. 27 years of comedic excellence. So it all starts with the headline, it, which isn't a surprise as a reader, because often the thing with The Onion, if you don't get the joke in the headline, you sort of haven't got the joke at all, I find. Yeah, I mean, we find a lot of people who uh, don't get the joke in the headline and take it uh, as real news, but you know, ultimately <laughs> everything begins with the headline, and it's really about an insight, you know, and social commentary that's super unique. The Onion does an amazing job of making sure they never make a joke that someone else makes, uh, or even that they've made in, you know, his 27-year history. And I think that's what makes it so special, is a lot of the stuff that they throw out every single day is really, really funny. It's just, is it Onion funny? Is it able, is it really stand on its own, and is it something, um, you know, that you want in your portfolio of amazing work for 27 years. And that American style of having a writer's room is something that in comedy we don't really do here, partly because of finances and partly because of tradition. But David, you kind of do do it a bit at that lot. You do have groups of people working on a campaign. Yeah, yeah. We, I mean, my background is more in comedy, in television comedy, is more writer's room than generally in the UK. So some of the shows that I've been involved with, like The Day to Day and Alan Partridge and sat satirically The Friday Night Armistice, um, there was a group of writers, there was a group of us coming up with ideas, um, and I'm presently working with Armando Yanucci again, and, and the way he works is very much in the American tradition. But you're right, in the UK, generally in television, it's one or two writers just forging their own way. Um, uh, but what I've tried to do is, yes, bring a sort of writer's room feel to uh, creating content for brands, uh, online social content for brands. Um, and certainly with like, the Have I Got News For Account, Have I Got News For You account, we sort of, there's a virtual 
uh, writer's room, so we might polish each other's jokes up on WhatsApp. WhatsApp is a godsend for us. Right, so this is the interesting thing, isn't it? Where even if you're using collaborative tools internally, actually, your average person on Twitter who's tweeting out a joke they think is funny is almost using a collaborative comic method, aren't they, by other people retweeting and getting involved? Yeah, I think what's really changed yeah. and what's... Sorry, Mike, what's, 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 is, is the... The topicality, the, the fact that you've got to get the get that joke, get it the hell out there quickly, which which I don't know how that affects you in the, at the Onion. Yeah, yeah I man, I think it's a pressure to be quick, but I think for us, you know, we do create timely content and tackle big issues because people want the Onion's take. The challenge is always, you know, are you commenting on something in a unique enough way that even if you're not the first one to make a joke, you actually have the best joke, you know? But I think that that's uh, I think where we're different than most people is we're super collaborative to make sure what we're doing is unique, um, you know, versus most individuals are, they believe something's unique and get it out in the world and people reward that uh, if it truly is. And I wonder, I don't want to get you to comment on yeah. someone else's business, but I wonder why Private Eye, which is the kind of UK equivalent yeah. of The Onion, obviously been going even longer than The Onion, uh, hasn't really embraced the online space and they've just started doing a podcast, but until now, They've been very much about driving people towards buying the magazine, and that's where our humor lies. Why has The Onion been successful online and adapting to that new method? Yeah, I mean, I think it begins with, uh, you know, kind of how the, the Onion began is in the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 1988, and it was a free weekly uh, newspaper that uh, was selling pizza coupons, you know, and nail salon ads. And they had the foundation of everyone consuming everything from The Onion for free always. And so we went on a online in 96, we didn't have a conflict of how do you get people to pay for content online when they're used to paying in print. It was just always something free and always, you know, uh, a publication that had to embrace advertising. So I think we had an advantage in that, um, you know, we were naturally kind of employing the web economics of being able to create content, you know, by funding it through advertising and didn't have to worry about how do we keep our subscription revenue, which I think is been a challenge for most companies, especially newspaper companies. And I, I guess all content providers have to think about the technology people are using to see that content. Uh, so, you know, someone using an iPod Touch, for example, is going to be having a different experience to someone uh, using a desktop computer. Do you have to think about that in terms of a joke as well? Does a joke play better on certain platforms? Yeah, I think um, so I, my, my main platform is, is Twitter, and I think as Twitter, as the platform evolves, like you used to have to click on a picture, click on a link to see a picture, which was quite a good joke mechanism because you could set up the uh, yeah. picture and then they'd click on it and they'd get the laugh when they clicked on it. But, but then we had to adapt, I, others had to adapt because now Twitter serves the pictures first. So sometimes you will look at the picture uh, and then uh, might read the, the tweet. And that has made you um, uh, adapt. But I think what's great is, is moving to video, moving, the use of GIFs, use of vines. Vines I find incredibly creative satirically because you can just bash one thing against another thing visually uh, and, and, it, and it works really strongly. So yeah, I think it's, it's trying to keep up with the platforms and, and seeing which platforms, you know, I mean, I'm not allowed to use Snapchat because I'm over 15, but those who <laughs> use Snapchat, there's phenomenal amount of tools. You know, they've just brought out a thing where you can change your voice um, on, on the Snapchat video, make it, you can make it speak backwards and stuff. So every, every, t every platform has its own tools that allows you to s use, do satire in a different way. And when it comes to seizing that moment, which you were both describing a moment ago, uh, there's some diplomacy as well that has to come with taste and decency, isn't there? Which even as a satirist, you kind of think, if the majority of people are going to see that and think, oh, that's bad taste, I wasn't really thinking that, then it's the wrong joke, even if you want to be the first one to make it. Uh, I suppose what I'm saying is, what are you going to do when the Queen dies? How long are you going to wait? Yeah, yeah, well, we had that when Mrs. Thatcher died. I mean, we have that all the time when anyone dies. I've actually published a guide to um, <laughs> what to do when someone dies, and I sort of feel that you could work out an algorithm of how long you need to, how long is too soon. I don't, yeah. you've probably done that, haven't you, on the, yeah. you know, a too soon algorithm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, it's about um, always, like Mike says, always knowing what your target is and being able to defend it. No, but 
it's inevitable that sometimes with Twitter, for instance, where you, you respond very quickly, that you get it wrong sometimes, and then you have to say, sorry, I got it wrong. And the, but the thing is, are you getting it wrong? Because retrospectively, it might be a funny joke. You know, a month later, you might look back and think, wow, that person had the balls to say that about Margaret Thatcher the day she died. But at the time, it's unpopular. Satire doesn't always thrive in a world where you're looking to be popular. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, I think, that, I think that's true at times. I think the key to everything, going back to the target, is is there a truth that survives the joke? You know, because the point of satire is to put the mirror to society and to really show something that, um, and say something that other people are having a hard time saying. So I think if you always have that side underneath, you know, whether you're, no matter what subject matter you're talking about, you end up, uh, as we always say, you know, afflicting the comfortable and comforting the afflicted, you end up having the right take, you know? And I think that's what makes the comedy not just stand, you know, as something really funny, but ultimately something satirical, you know? And it, it seems what, you, what you've both done recently is you've started parodying the form of the internet itself, which is something that maybe you can only do once the medium's a little bit more sophisticated and everyone's used to that idea. So you'll do things about YouTube campaigns, for example, subverting them. Uh, and Clickhole, which you were talking about, it, it's a joke about listicle websites and BuzzFeed type trending articles, but those articles are themselves often quite ironic. Yeah, I mean, I think you're parroting something that's pretty self-aware in, in terms of BuzzFeed, but obviously it's not just BuzzFeed, it's the internet overall. And I think what you know, ClickHole does so well is it kind of makes fun of the two different facets of clickbait. One is the, you know, the publisher's quest to get clicks, you know, and so they're doing anything to try to engage you to find a way to get you to basically see an ad you know, at some yeah. point. But also the user side, where even though you're going to click on something that's terrible, and won't be fulfilling, you can't help but click. I hate that, I hate that fact that I, I always think that God did really well to sell the commandments as the Ten Commandments. <laughs> because if it was just the commandments, no one would have bothered. But it's something about the Ten Commandments, like that BuzzFeed or click, you know, you click on it, you want to yeah. sign up to that coveting ass thing, because, yeah. you know, there's ten of them. Yeah, now it would be the 33 reasons you're not going to hell. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk about monetization, that dirty word that comes into every conversation. It is seen as a dirty word, isn't it, by a lot of comedy audiences. They don't like the idea of being sold to because that's not what they've gone to you for, but you need to sustain the medium. Yeah, I think it's, it's a challenge for all content creators is, you know, uh, really premium content, content that takes a lot of care and energy and a lot of talent to people to create you need to find a way to finance it. And for us, it's always been through advertising, um, yet The Onion also has this kind of anti-establishment side to it. So it's always been a delicate balance of you know, how you become you know, great at getting advertising to support what you want to do, but also staying true to what we do. So we've done a really smart job with our sponsored content, where we make sure that advertisers are part of a joke, and we make sure that we're making fun you know, with the brand in front of our audience so that everyone you know, who follows The Onion, who sees some type of sponsored content, they know exactly what it is. So making fun with the brand does mean slightly taking the piss out of the brand, doesn't it? How up are they for that? Yeah, I mean, I think the right brands understand that in order to reach people who are under 15 or under uh, 35, you need, to, you need to do something different than traditional advertising. And so, the best way to create something authentic, as the brand uh, people like to say, is actually is through comedy. And if you can't, if you take yourself too seriously, the younger audience just doesn't give you any credit. And so we work really closely with brands to say, be in on the joke, don't take yourself seriously, because if you are actually able to be self-aware and be part of it, your ad campaign will be successful. And do you think UK brands are? just as willing to have that conversation. Yeah, I think it does vary on the brands. You know, we, we, we say that we have a sort of bravery scale that we say, you know, where are you on the bravery <laughs> scale? And so like a, a, an account like Have I Got News For You obviously is right out there on the bravery scale at 10 um, out of 10. Um, but then there are other brands who are, are less willing. But I think humor is such a strong uh, element. There's, a, there's an account that I really like called uh, for Arena Flowers, which is, I don't know if you know, so it's at Arena Flowers. And what they do is they've just decided we're not going to sell. We're not going to sell, promote flowers. We're just going to do jokes. We're just going to do humor. Uh, and uh, Paddy Power's done really well in that way as well. You know, uh, that, and that just, they just use the humor to promote, um, promote their product. And I suppose you could say from the people, you know, what's the compromise that we're making as, as comedy writers of writing for Arena Flowers or, you know, for our 
perhaps we work with Virgin or HTC, whoever it is, um, writing them content that may be co uh, comedy content. Um, and you do have to compromise. That's, that, that's a certain thing. But it's great that some brands just say, go for it, do what you want. I mean, you ask the man in the street, what's Twitter? And they'd probably say it's for news and jokes. I mean, that is what most people use it for. It's sort of the perfect medium for satire, isn't it? But could it get better? Are there developers in this room who could actually make a better comedy product? Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, Twitter's a lively place as well. You know, it's, uh, but, but I think it, it is, for me, I found it perfect for um, what it's, there's, you know, Oscar Wilde would have creamed himself, I'm going to say, but it feels a bit <laughs> wrong to say that at this time. Um, but, um, he, you know, it's the perfect vehicle for one-liners. That's why, you know, the onion works so well, though, is not it? Yeah. That? I mean, since we start with the headline, everything is really made for Twitter. Um, and so, it, for us, it's the perfect way to make sure that your point is super succinct, you know, and it's great comedy. And if you can't have a headline be understood and be funny, it's... You know, uh, I mean, that really is the litmus test of what works. But it's also so transient as well. You know, you look back a great, across the great satirists of the age, Jonathan Swift or whatever, um, they may have creamed themselves on Twitter, but they probably wouldn't still be being talked about hundreds of years later. Do you sometimes worry I, that it's so transient? I, don't, I, th I, I can still remember the gr reading a great joke and thinking, that's fantastic, or a great tweet. I, I, I don't think it is that transient. I still think... You know, and The Onion would be an example I would, I would give. There's certain things that The Onion have posted where you just remember them. And so I don't, I don't agree with that. You're wrong. I'm wrong. Yeah. <laughs> OK, well, on, on that bombshell, I suppose we better end uh, because the flashing clock is saying we have to, but we could obviously talk forever. Uh, thank you very much. Big thanks to my panelists, Mike and David. Thank you. Thank you.